Um, it's reminded me about the additional issues around rural health, and actually, I have a, I'm at Utah's um, in the Centre for Rural Health. Um, Tasmania's terrible, I've got to say, and what was, what's been really cool since we arrived here is we keep hearing how great the services are here. I know that that still means that you need to travel distances probably for some of the specialist care, but um, it's so nice to come into an area and just hear all this positive feedback, um, and that, that's really important. Um, you just jump into here. Uh, one of the things that we did at BCNA, um, gosh, I get my years now, maybe 10 years ago, was that there was some, we were doing these forums and we kept hearing about um, women who were living with metastatic disease and the services in terms of counselling and support, there just wasn't anything that they felt they fitted into. Um, and that was what I think was this, this shift in treatments actually benefiting women with, um, with, and men with metastatic disease and so they were living longer. So when I first started out 30 years ago, um, if someone was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer, I would be talking to them about palliative care. And then the whole world changed, but we really have taken a long time to try and catch up in terms of services. So we ran um, a telephone counselling service just for people with metastatic disease for I think about five years and it, and it was certainly moved all over Australia and fam, our family members. And what came out of that was we're really grateful that this treatment is now keeping me alive for longer than anyone thought I was going to be, but what the hell do I do with that? And what does that mean and when is it going to stop and do I just keep having treatment? And Really, we were not set up at all. We, as healthcare professionals, we haven't caught up, and um, we're still getting there. But it's still an uncertainty. So, whilst it's a really fantastic thing, and we keep hearing with more and more treatments that are um, holding people in place, um, that doesn't mean that it's an easy road, or that there's a whole lot of guidance. And so, when you, if you're diagnosed with early stage breast cancer, there are these you know, points, we're going to do this and then we're going to do that and the service is available with you here and, and we're still catching up. Um, so we started doing some work in this area and um, we still have a lot more work to do. So uh, I think it was mentioned this morning, this idea of um, people saying you're so strong and you're kind of going, didn't actually have any other choice. <laughs> and. Um, and that's the fact of it. You get hands of this and you don't have any choice but to cope with whatever that means. Um, and whether you are someone who had early stage breast cancer and then a recurrence or you were diagnosed with advanced um, breast cancer, I mean, I think it just throws anyone because of the level of uncertainty. Um, and you look for hope, as you were saying, and whatever that might mean for you, that's hard, hard to find it. I, I still think there's going to be a time where we go, okay, this is what we do with an estate breast cancer, and we know that it actually will get that. At the moment, it's hard to find that. I'm going to read you this quote from someone that um, I was working with that really just. It's, it's said, I know this is only her experience, but for me it kind of um, said the whole gamut of it. Um, so when she received her diagnosis, she said, I felt angry and then hopeless and then panicked and then I think I was depressed, I had trouble eating and sleeping. It was like an emotional flood with so many thoughts going around and around in my head. What about this person? What about that person? What about me? Um, I don't know if you relate to that, but just this flurry of busyness in your mind um, and what we know is that does settle, it's a, it's a little bit like someone got their life and went through it and it does settle down and then you start to work out things but it is so much to take on at once. And you know we have to talk about a journey and you are set on this road, you know, okay journey? Yeah, lots of people do. Yeah, I like that. Um, this feels a little bit like, more like the road that I hear people are on. This is actually in a road in Tassie um, that you go up to the closest mountain to where I live, so I live on system, that you can go skiing. It's called Mount Barrow. And this road is called Jacob's Ladder. And it is, it's one lane 
And so in, when snow season is on, if you're going up and someone's coming down, you have to reverse into one of the corners. Um, and it's slippery, you know. Um, and I, when I think about my how I've aged and how I kind of deal with things in life now, I remember going up this road as a young person, going up this cool with all the views, and then going up on the back of a ute with, you know, in our 20s, um, with guys driving, thinking it was really funny to, you know, all those trail flips on. Now I don't go up it. I'm just like, you know, you just get, sometimes you just take on a whole lot of life and you're like, there's something that I want to face. But I think that whatever this road is, it's much more like that. <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you even a different picture of what I hear it's more like. But regardless of what term you use, going from being someone without cancer to someone with cancer is a transition. It's kind, of, it's kind of the understatement of the century, but it is a transition. And it's like going from being um, someone with no children to becoming a mother or someone who, um, I don't know, lives in the country who moves to the coast. It is a major transition. Um, but it's one that you absolutely, as you say, you have no choice about. So I often use an analogy of crossing a bridge. And the reason why I do that is because often when I'm asked to talk with someone who's really struggling, they're usually in the middle of this bridge. So you start off before you hit the bridge and you have a whole lot of things in your life. You have plans, you have goals, you have people you are pretty sure you can rely on, you trust your body, whatever. Um, you have a way of life and then you're made to walk this bridge and you have no idea what's on the other end of it. And when you're in the middle, it's really uncomfortable because all of those things that we were sure about are suddenly we're unsure about. And so it's an uncomfortable place to be and we need strategies to be able to cross that bridge. And there's lots of things to watch out for. Um, and one of the things, of course, especially I think with metastatic disease is that information can be a really mixed blessing. It is absolutely understandable that we Google and that we want answers um, and that we ask questions um, that actually there's no answer for. What, what's going to happen? How long is this going to take? Will this work? All that stuff. Um, incredibly difficult. And that's why some people go, they keep searching and they keep trying new things and they keep asking different people. It's because they just want some, some certainty. Um, and from a healthcare professional point of view, it's pretty uncomfortable too because we often go, we're actually not sure. And that's, you know, it's just, it, that's just difficult. Um, one of the things that's really important is to think about the fact that there is an emotional fallout when you look at information. When the internet first started, we developed a, um, a pamphlet and it was about safe surfing. Um, it was like, don't go surfing somewhere you, you know, don't know about, don't go surfing on your own, all that stuff, and, and that is still true. So, you know, what can happen is you may be online and you're looking at, you know, at the latest sale on something and you click and then you go, oh, what about this? And then you go, and then you go, okay, I'm now, I'm up at night, I'm on my own, I've just read something that's completely thrown me. Um, so use information that you find to give you the questions to ask people that you think. Um, I can actually tell you because there's some really tricky things that you come across and you are drawn to it because I mean, that certainty is hard. And, um, so that's just a point I want to make. Um, then we have the stuff to deal with about all the stupid things people say to us. Um, this is um, one of a series of cards by Emily McDowell.com. You can look them up. Um, and a lot of them just say what we often hear. This one says, I'm so sorry to, uh, you're sick. I want you to know I'll never try and sell you some random treatment I read about on the internet. And the other friends you want to have around, but actually the reason why this card is a bestseller is because actually it's amazing that people tell us all sorts of things. Um, that aren't helpful, but we do, you know, they do it because they care. The other really big thing is the pressure to be positive. And this is an unspoken thing. We almost kind of know it um, before anyone even says that it's not okay for you to say to me you're scared. 
um, to your kids or to your partner or to your mother or to certain people in your life. You just know they can't hear that. Um, and so there's this real pressure to be positive. And if you're not positive, then you're not coping. And actually, the, where this comes from is some research in the 70s that kind of suggested that if you are angry or you are um, suppressing feelings and you're not focusing on positives, that that's what causes cancer. It came out of, that seemed to be the start of this flurry of think positively. Um, it's really unhelpful because uh, if you're faced with a whole lot of uncertainty, the most normal thing is that you're not going to like that. Um, you will also be able to see all sorts of great things that happen in life too, so it's not just all going to be bad. But if you have the pressure to be what is a really abnormal state, and that is, I'm totally fine, and I'm so grateful, and I'm all this all the time, um, that is just an added way. You've already got enough to deal with, but that's a really strong, almost unspoken thing when someone says, how are you doing? You kind of know they want you to tell them that they don't you're doing fine. Um, I'm doing some work at the moment on trauma, and the more I do it, and, I, and in fact, I, used, I think I started using the word trauma as in cancer as a traumatic experience years ago, and now we're understanding more and more about it. So let me tell you a bit about trauma, because there, um, there are two sorts of trauma. One is called big T trauma, and one's called little t trauma. So big T trauma is... I've been in a car accident and everyone else died in the car accident or I lost my leg. Or, so there's stuff that people go, gosh, that must have been a trauma. Um, little T trauma is about when things happen, something happens to you that completely throws you. And it's often quite invisible. So um, I'm trying to think of an example of, I don't know, you're in school and uh, you're um, writing and you don't realise the teacher's watching you and the teacher screams at you in front of everyone and you have this feeling and you never forget that feeling. Um, and what we know is that later on you can be triggered by that. You can be really careful that you never put your fat head down when someone's talking because you have had a felt response from it. And I think that happens all the time. So let me just describe this to you. So trauma is when you have an adverse event that overwhelms your ability to cope. So it takes you by surprise and you're not, you don't really know how to manage it at the time. Your mind becomes flooded with emotion and for a minute, you often unconsciously stop feeling. Um, and it can be like you're watching yourself in a movie. A lot of people explain this to me in a, a way when, when they receive the news about cancer. So they're sitting in the room, they might have some idea that it's, I don't know, you're not sure what the doctor's going to say, and they say it and it's like suddenly you are outside of your body and you're watching it happen. Um, and the reason why this happens is because we're actually really clever and our bodies protect us. So it's how, what happens with grief, it wants, it's what happens when any big thing happens. Um, but it's often really um, a silent thing and other people don't see it. And the cost is that we freeze it and then it's just kind of still sitting in there until we are able to actually process it. So um, an example for me, and I I knew that this was happening, and I remember actually thinking to myself, wow, gee, um, aren't, aren't bodies and minds amazing, even though this was a terrible situation, but I was on a tram going to work, um, and I got a phone call to say that my sister had died um, unexpectedly, hadn't woken up overnight. And I was on this really busy tram, and I remember taking a breath and kind of feeling that, what that might have meant, and then going, okay, what do I have to do? Who do I have to call? I have to make sure someone's with my mum, do all of that stuff. Um, and I knew that something had switched over and that was protecting me. But at some point I was going to need to re you know, visit what that actually means. And I think that there are lots of those experiences when you go through cancer treatment and telling people and we underestimate the trauma that it is. Okay. One of the things that I find um, really helpful in understanding trauma is, and this is, um, there's a guy called Gabriel Mate who writes incredible books about this if you're interested, but he says, trauma is not what happens to you, it is what happens inside you 
as a result of what happens to you. So you can have three people that have been in a car accident, same car accident, and two of them might be kind of okay, a bit upset that, you know, it's going to cost money or whatever, but the one person, for whatever reason, is completely thrown by it and it changes them and they might not want to get in cars anymore or they, whatever might happen. So it's often a really silent thing. It is what happens inside you because of what's happened to you. And so we, as healthcare professionals, we often don't see it. And as people who have those experiences, we, we don't even quite know what's just happened. Like, it takes us by surprise. And we need to be more and more open to checking in with that. Another favourite statement that we get said to us is, um, wow, you look, you look really good, or could you look good, or there might be lots of different ways that people say that to you. That's another way that um, often uh, people say to you, I want you to tell me that everything's good, or you're looking really good, so I'm not really sure what metastatic breast cancer must mean, like do you finish treatment, because you, you're looking good. Um, again, it's a lack of understanding um, and we need to just be open about, you know, thanks, I just bought this dress, but actually it's still really hard or whatever you want to say to people. So some of the things that I think add to the stress of living with um, metastatic disease. So one is how, how hard it is to, say, to carry the sadness of others and um, we are all women in this room. Um, women are particularly good at doing this. And, you know, we get a diagnosis and then we think how it's going to impact on our kids and our family and our friends. And, you know, we kind of come last. We still, even when we're faced with this, think, oh gosh, what's this going to do to my horse? Yeah, it's something that we do. I actually believe that cancer comes into a family, like it walks the door and it's there in the family. And I use that term broadly, so whatever your, you, it means for you, your family, the people that are close to you. Um, and one of the ways I explain it is with one of these mobiles. Um, so you know these mobiles kind of balance off each other, and it also looks a little bit like a family tree. Um, and if, now I think this bit in the middle is blue, <laughs> Does everyone else see it's blue? Any other colours? Teal, green, because clearly we've found in you know, recent years that people see different colours, but anyway, I'm talking about that one. If I was to come along and flick that piece, so that's the bit that's got cancer. So I walk in the room, I'm cancer, and I go flick. What's going to happen to all the other pieces here? They're going to move, and they're going to, but they're going to move differently. So some are going to switch around. Some of them might get caught up with each other. Some of them might just kind of move a little bit, not really get um, worried. Um, this could be your three children. <laughs> they will do different things. But it comes in and it impacts on all of them. And I've always believed that when we, um, as healthcare services, if we're giving a diagnosis and we're talking about the impact on you, we, sh we should be saying, what else do we need to do for your family? Um, partly so you don't have to carry that as well, but partly because they are, they have their own trauma now. Um, and we should do more of that rather than have you carry the guilt of that. But we know it comes in and it affects everyone. Um, we know that with research around partners now, there will be some people that have partners who um, aren't there, that we certainly know partners who leave or who leave in their head. Um, and Kathy was, was reminding me the other night about a session that we did in a very remote part of um, Australia and we were talking about this and she put her hand up, she said, when my husband found out I had breast cancer, he fucking went to bed for four weeks. <laughs> he just went to bed. Like, I just, I just had to get on with it. Hilarious. Um, but we know that a lot of partners are crucial to this journey. And we've done a lot of research now to know that if we can measure who's, you know, what the stress levels are, because they're very different stresses, so they're not the same, um, that partners can experience as much, sometimes even more, stress 
um, than the person with cancer. And part of that is because if you feel out of control and like you don't have enough information, they really feel like they don't have any control over this. Um, so we really need to, and we, and we don't set them up very well. Um, we give you the information and you go home and then they think, okay, I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do. And everyone means them and says, how is she? Um, and maybe doesn't ask them. So we've got a lot, a lot of way to go for partners as well. Um, we've talked a bit about children, adult children, grandchildren. Um, we know that children um, are susceptible to levels of stress, just like adults are. That may sound quite obvious these days. Um, 30 years ago, it, that wasn't even obvious. Um, but what we know is that children will cope if they know what's going on and they will not cope if they're not sure what's going on. And in fact, because cognitively children view the world um, from, their, from their perspective, so they, um, it's all about how many impacts on me, that's not because they're selfish, that's because that's what their brains can do. And so if we don't give them information, invariably they'll think they've done something wrong. I know this for a fact because I've sat with many children who suppose they weren't told anything and I've asked them what they think is going on and they've heard quite a bit and they know something big's happening and that there's some good reason why they haven't been involved in it, which of course just complicates things. So we know that whilst everything in our being is to not upset the children in our lives and not make them sad and not make them worry, um, the most loving thing we can do is explain in an age-appropriate way what's going on, keep the door open for them to be able to come to us when they're ready, um, and enable them to still be able to have this, the normal things in their life because that's really important. So if they say, okay, thanks for telling me about it, is there any other, after they ask, are you going to die? Because often they will just come straight up with those questions. Um, and then they might say, can I still go and play footy? And we think, God, do I mean anything to this child? But actually, that's what they need to do. They need to get them to do both those things. Friendships. I won't ask you to put your hands up, but I'm going to assume that most people in this room have at least one person that they would have be sure that they would have been there if something like this happened, and they weren't. Um, it's a really common experience. It's, it's one of the griefs of um, having a big, horrible thing happen to you. Um, and it's got nothing to do with you. It's really, really common. And there are lots of reasons for this. The person just can't manage it um, or it confronts them in, in a way. Um, but it's really difficult. But what we also know is that often people have, have people that come and help that they just would never have thought. You know, they're the neighbour that used to say just hello and suddenly the other one taking the washing or doing whatever. But it's complicated. It's an area we don't talk enough about. Um, and female friendships, you know, they don't get any easier. You, we thought they hit a peak when we were 14 um, in terms of complication, but actually they continue to be tricky. Um, but it's not just females. But most people will have someone that they just sure would have been there and for whatever reason they would not have been able to. Um, The important thing, of course, is to embrace the people who rally around you during this tough time. And part of that, you know, going onto the bridge and things changing, is that we can realise we are very, very loved by certain people and that are the people that really matter to us, and we embrace that. But it's it's part of the um, dealing with all the different things. Now, I'm going to read this. I think this is, I, I probably could have a shorthand way of, of saying this, but it's much better if I use um, the quote. But one of the things I think about, um, I hear about, is that there is an impact on who I am in the world now. Um, and this is me not having had metastatic breast cancer. So let me read what this person says. Uh, Chris and I attended an anniversary brunch about two months after my diagnosis with meds. And I sat there thinking how different I was from everyone else there. I was sick. I wasn't sure of the future. I had to endure suffering and I hated everyone else for the good life that they had. I've become very impatient over the years with other people and their complaints. How dare they complain to me? I usually get over it and become my own supportive self. I want to be the one there for my family and friends. I hate always being on the receiving ends. 
Sometimes I feel so inadequate and yet I know how much I'm loved and how lucky I am. So much you're taking. I'm not sure if that resonates with any of you, but um, it, it seems like there is both a real embracing of the people around you and yet there is a part of this that is the lonely place to be that feels like you are different and you're kind of watching the world go on um, with things and you're now in this place where, um, <clears throat> I think as someone said this morning, actually none of us know what's going to happen tomorrow, but when you um, are faced with a diagnosis where it's been stated to you that there is uncertainty in your future and you can't get away from that. Um, and it's hard to pretend. We all pretend that we all know what's going to happen tomorrow, but some days it just must feel like, you know what, you guys are all, it's great that you've got peace of mind, but for me that, that's really hard. Um, and yeah, I miss the old me, I miss the happy me, everything has changed. I'm going to get up to some positives in a sec, <laughs> very soon. Um, so impact on the future, and I'm going to talk now about what strategies can help, but it is a really delicate walk to balance hope and chaos. Um, and that is the walk, and that is really normal, and it's like, um, I've heard lots of different, you know, people, I think, in the early days when I started working in this area, talked about a roller coaster that people are on. I actually think, especially when you're talking about metastatic disease, it's more a bit like a pendulum. So it's like there are days when there is, you don't feel the hope and it's just really hard, and then there are days when you do, and it swings like this, and that is normal. So it can feel like, oh, you know, am I doing all right or am I not doing all right? Actually, what's normal is that you swing between those two things. Okay, so I'm going to give some of my tips um, for what they're worth. So the first thing is, and I think KP pointed it out this morning, and now two amazing speakers pointed it out too, and it sounds, thank you, it sounds, um, this might sound like a really obvious thing, but we amazingly have to remind ourselves all the time, it's really important to acknowledge emotional distress. So when I said right at the start about you've got people make you feel like you have to be positive, the reality is that you are a normal, healthy, mental, mentally health person who has been put into a very extraordinary situation. And that is going to bring about emotional distress. And it's really important to just acknowledge that and not be scared of it and let it come when you're feeling uncertain or when you feel like you cry or you feel like this is too much, knowing it will pass. What the problem comes when you either judge yourself on it, um, gosh, I should be grateful, I should be happy or I should be whatever, that's when we get into trouble. Or when you don't acknowledge it and actually you've got anxiety or depression symptoms coming that we could help with. Um, and they're really understandable. So the first thing is, is to acknowledge distress. The other is, um, and we heard this beautifully from you this morning, is to focus on now. And this is so powerful, and again, it sounds really simple. So when you're standing there at the bottom of the stairs um, of either, I've just been told I have a certain disease, or this is, we're going to try this, and then if that doesn't, we're going to try that, and then we're not really sure, and blah, blah, blah. Those stairs, totally overwhelming. And it's not helpful to look into the future for any of us. Um, it's understandable that we go, what about next Christmas? What about Christmas after? Are we, am I going to be okay to go to a wedding in two years' time? No, no idea. None of us have any idea. But if I say to you, uh, have says to women that I've worked with who have rang me and said I can't cope, I'm not doing well, I'm not going to manage this week. And I go, can you make it till lunchtime? And can you plan, I don't know, a really good cup of tea or something? Um, can you make a plan to make a cake that they love making this week? Can you focus on right now? And then they go, yeah, I can. So let's just do that. And actually think about it. So when you make the tea, you think about you know, pouring the water in and stopping and how it tastes and you focus on now. All of us can do that, regardless of what we're facing. So bringing the focus back down is really crucial and it's really powerful. And that time length, how many steps you feel like you can manage at any given time will change all the time. Um, it can often be between 
um, doctor's visits or um, standings treatment. And I mean, I'm not sure how it's going to go for two weeks, so I need to plan the next two weeks, and then I'll think beyond that. Then, whatever that time frame is for you at the moment, that's what you focus on. And you almost need to, like, you have a remote control, and as soon as your mind goes, but what about Christmas? You go change your channel. Bring me back to this this step that I can cope with. It's really powerful if you can keep reminding yourself to do that. The next thing is about challenging your thoughts. Not everything you think um, is actually true. And if some of you have heard about CBT or cognitive behavioural therapy, there's heaps of things online about it. It's really powerful, and I'm going to give you a really quick snippet of it. So what happens is situations happen to us and they lead us to have a thought and that thought gives us a feeling and then an action and then some sort of behaviour and that we do this all the time without thinking. I'll give you an example. Okay, so um, a situation might be that you hear some of your friends went out without you. So you're having an okay morning and then, I don't know, you look on Facebook and you see a picture that all your friends went out without you. So you're feeling fine and then suddenly you're like, how come they didn't invite me? Is that because I don't really mean anything to them or whatever thought? So these are what's called automatic negative thoughts. We all have them and they're usually full of um, mistakes and problems and they usually, we usually over dramatise them in our head. So whatever that might make me think. How come they didn't invite me? Now I'm starting to feel tense and upset. I was fine before I turned on Facebook and Chief Facebook can do it, can't it? Um, I have daughters, you know, in their twenties, can really throw them. Um, and then you might start to get a headache and your shoulders feel tight and you might withdraw and you might go and not going to contact them, any of them, I don't care, I'm not going to let them bother me. So what's happened is the situation's happened, it's led to a thought that is usually an unhelpful thought, we do it all the time, and then it, it throws us, sorry about the microphone then, um, into feeling bad. Let's see, automatic negative thought. Gosh. Okay, so given this, if, okay, <laughs> that's pretty impressive. Um, oh, here we go. Let's do it on here. Um, let's go through how we challenge these thoughts. And can I tell you, often we get to the point where we've got the headache before we even realise something happened, and we have to go back. I was really good to explain why am I so tense? Go back to that thing that happened. But let me give you one that's not uncommon. So uh, you notice that your shoulder hurts when you're hanging out the washing. The thought is somewhere back here, uh, the cancer spread. So we might not even think it, but we're hanging out, we go to tense, and then we start to kind of overbreathe. And then uh, maybe uh, and our heart goes fast, and then we go, that's it, I'm going to go back to bed, and don't want to face today. Uh, we might even avoid going to the next appointment to the doctor or the GP, because it's all too scary. Um, but what we can learn to do when we get to that point is, hang on a sec, I'm feeling really panicked. Well, I'm feeling panicked. How come I'm feeling panicked? It's because of that thought. What am I going to do? I have to challenge that thought. So I challenge the thought that the cancer's back and I'm scared. Okay, how am I going to challenge it? There are lots of reasons why my shoulder could be sore. Um, I should address it and move on. I should use some coping strategies, first of all, to um, switch around what has happened physically in my body. So I feel I feel all tense. I need to breathe down, I need to lower on my shoulders. I do this, this is what I do for my I need to lower on my shoulders, get my breath back, and then I'm going to do something about it. So that might be I'm going to plan to give myself a couple of days, I'm going to take some Panadol or whatever, I'm going to put the heat pack on, but in two days' time, if it's still sore, I'm going to do something about it, but I can put that worry away now until then. So instead of going to bed with drawing and going, oh, this is all just too hard, I'm going to start looking at what these automatic negative thoughts are. Um, okay, another one that we talked about a bit this morning is letting go of the things that we can't control. 
sounds obvious, but it is actually true. So, you know, if there's a wedding coming up and you're getting stressed that it's going to rain and you get really stressed and then you see the weather forecast and you're really stressed, God, everything's terrible, it might rain. You actually have no control over whether it's going to rain. And so you go, okay, what are we going to do if it rains rather than just carrying that weight. So here are some things that you can let go of um, that need to be perfect. Um, Self-doubt and comparison. Again, social media, terrible. We compare ourselves to people's best picture of what they life, what they want us to think their life is. Um, the fear of failure um, and um, holding onto control, living up to the expectations of others, the need to please everyone else, and the weather, and whether um, I can get an appointment with the doctor next week or whatever it is, the things that you can't control. If you let go of those, this is going to give you more chance to actually focus on what you can. Okay, this is my second last tip. Um, so this came from uh, my PhD study and I did this because I kept um, being sent uh, at that stage, women who had finished treatment for early stage breast cancer, who had coped well, they'd gone through treatment. I, my office was in the oncology, day oncology ward, so I saw them all the way through. I saw them at the start and they did treatment and they were doing fine. And then they would come for their checkup after treatment finished, and the doctor would call me and say, Carrie, you've seen them, they can't stop crying. Because apparently that's what social workers do, they stop people crying. Um, <coughs> But as I was very young, early social worker, we hadn't done a lot of work really in the cancer world around treatment completion and survivorship, if I want a very different word, but what happens after treatment finishes. Um, we really didn't understand what did happen. And I would get back to the trauma thing. So what we found happened is that when you are faced with an overwhelming situation like a diagnosis, and then you've got to go into treatment, uh, and you don't get a time to breathe, it's not until you stop that you can look back on it. So it makes sense that that's when you go, oh my God, this is me. So we asked people at, um, what they, how, how they described a normal week for them. And they told me about these three areas that they moved in and out of. And they were meaning, suffering and coping. So the suffering, let me give you an example of someone who has bone metastases and when they wake up in the morning they ache because there's been a period somewhere they've had their last um, pain medication or they've just been still. And so they wake up and they think, I, I'm awake and I'm in pain, I don't want to do this anymore, this is just horrible, I hate my life. That's suffering. Then their partner comes in and says, oh you're awake, that's good, let's get you up, let's get you your pain medication, how about you have a warm shower, mood, get moving. And they do all of that. So this is coping. These are the things we do every day to keep going. And they feel better. And then a friend rings and says, it's a really beautiful day. Let's go for a walk down the beach. Um, and we go, God, I'm so loved. So they've moved in and out of coping, suffering, and meaning. This is what we do, all of us do every day. And that's not not coping. That is a really normal reaction. The problem can be when we're faced with a difficult time, is that we forget the meaning stuff. And the, and the strategy is to get that meaning. If you focus on the meaningful things in your life, you rebalance it. So it doesn't take away the hard stuff, but it rebalances it. Um, and we proved that in this study. And by these, I don't I mean little means. I don't mean that you need to work out what the meaning of your life is and what you're here to bring to the world. It's about the little meaning. So it's about a fascination with nature. Often people really, they really feel that um, in these situations. Uh, it's doing what you love, it's having this feeling, whether it's stage diving, um, or this is apparently the jetty, something mm -hmm. around here, jumping off um, the jetty. In Lone System we have a couple of bridges and they get cold though, yeah. and there's also in the gorge in Lone System there are these big rocks and the water is um, there's, a, there's one called Daddy's 
I don't know what school doing, but it's, you know, I don't think anyone's ever found the bottom of it. So it's a rite of passage that you go jumping off things when you're, I did it, but never again. But it's this feeling, it's whatever brings you that feeling. So it might be, I'm sitting in the garden with grandkids and it's sunny and I don't have to worry about anything when they're gorgeous. So um, it's about having one of those things. Kindness, and we really feel it now, don't we? We feel kindness in a big way and giving that to others. The really simple beauty in the world, connecting with other people becomes really important. And if you don't have people in your life that you're connecting with, find them. And I don't mean people that you can have heart to hearts with. I mean, go and do classes, go to the movies with people, go and connect, 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 because it really, that's what we need. And check in with what you need right now. So I mean today, because it changes all the time, but what are you doing to take care of yourself? Are you getting the best medical care at the moment? Are you getting your answers met? Are you seeking and finding support, and encouragement and love from those around you? If you don't have that, it's something you need to find. Um, and if there is something more from all of the other possibilities that might enhance and enrich your life right now, Make a note, I'm going to do that, because that is one of the things that you can do. And the final thing is, allow yourself permission to not be brave sometimes. Courage does not always roar. Sometimes courage is the quiet voice at the end of the day saying, I will try it again tomorrow. Um, and that is all that you need to do. So I have my take-home messages slide, because I was asked to now put it in here. Um, and these are the ones I want you to take away with you. Acknowledge emotional distress and that it is normal and it's a healthy way to respond to a really horrible situation and um, all of the beautiful things that come with it as well. Focus on now. It's a tip all of us need to be doing. Challenge your thoughts if they're not being helpful to you. Let go of what you can't control. Identify what is meaningful to you and focus on that. Check in with what you need right now and allow yourself permission to not be brave sometimes. Thank you.